The defense force are off the shore of an island, watching as a battle unfolds when one of the crew members asks the captain if it is really alright for them to not get involved or provide support for the people on the island. But the captain reminds him that they are nameless side characters, so the second they get too close to the action, they will be killed for plot development. It is best that they just leave the fighting up to the hunters on the island instead. And on that island, we see a man running through the brush of the forest while being chased by a monster of some sort, but this was all part of his plan as he was simply leading it to his party so they can jump it. However, as the team ready themselves to jump whatever comes out of that forest, they are met with an army of ants and now have to fight one-on-one -on -one battles. Unfortunately, these guys have never had a fight where they didn't gang up on their opponent, so now that they have to have fair fights, their lack of skill is apparent. The swordsman gets bodies by one ant, while the mage squad completely fails to do any damage with their flame spells. They came with intentions of jumping the ants but got their asses, jumped instead, and the last one standing has lost the will to fight. The leader of the team is laid out on the ground, slowly bleeding to death and has no one to blame except himself for losing the battle. But before he can lose consciousness and become ant food, the ant on top of him gets knocked off, but a new hunter who clearly knows what he is doing. This skilled hunter wastes no time and immediately pops a revive on the whole squad to save him from dying, but in doing so, he leaves his back wide open for the ants to attack. However, he didn't come here alone and has his teammate save him with a lightning strike. Meanwhile, another one of his teammates, Yugo, is busy manhandling the ants with nothing but his fists, and the lightning wielder soon joins in as backup. These are some of the few S-ranked hunters, and the gap between these guys and the average schmuck is so vast that no one even comes close to their level of strength. Once the two have taken care of most of the ants, they tell the healer, Byungu, that he went too far out ahead of them, which is too reckless to be doing in a situation like this. He apologizes, but he needed to rush out to save these people as soon as possible, and besides, he got faith in their ability to keep him safe while he healed them. Soon after, a giant white ant appears, although it doesn't look like this is the boss. It is most likely the leader of the monsters here. So he leaves the injured people in the care of Byungu and tells Unsak to join him in battle as they take down this monster. They both charge forward and ready their weapons for an attack. So as the ant attacks Yuo first, he holds it in place while Unsak comes in from above and hits it with a lightning strike. While the ant is stunned from the shock, Yuo takes the opportunity to rip off its mandibles, enraging the ant and causing it to kick him away. But he wasn't done yet as he uses those same mandibles as projectiles and launches them straight through the abdomen of the ant, killing it in one blow. However, they are far from done since several more of those ants emerge from the forest and Yuho is starting to get excited by the battle. He powers up and begins emanating purple energy while Unsak does the same and releases a torrent of consecutive lightning strikes at the incoming horde. But while this is going on, on the other side of the city, there is another S-ranked hunter leading a team of side characters to stop the advancement of the ants. Once the average schmuck signals that everyone is ready, Choi unleashes a powerful fire blast that instantly roasts all the smaller ants, but the larger ones manage to make it through, so the cannon fodder must now engage in battle to hold them off. More than a decade ago, a portal that connects this world to many others opened and various kinds of monsters and magical beasts began to invade. They soon realized that they were unable to do any damage with the weaponry they had, and they would have been at the mercy of the invaders if not for one thing. Humans began to awaken special abilities, and these people were called hunters. They are classified from a sprank where we see all the really impressive hunters, all the way down to this loser in E rank. But once an ability is awakened, it can no longer be developed. Three years have passed, and we see a construction site which has now become a dungeon raid site as a man grabs some breakfast before he heads in. One of his friends calls out to him as he eats, and he is surprised to see him there since he heard that Park quit being a hunter. That was true, but then he got backhanded by the economy after his wife got pregnant a second time so he needs to earn a lot of money quick and a dungeon raid would be perfect for it. They continue to catch up as we see the man himself, Jinwoo, the same loser that was at the bottom of the rankings. He greets everyone nervously as he enters, so Park asks why everyone seems to know who he is, wondering if he is some kind of really strong hunter, but it's actually the opposite. Jin Wu is regarded as the single weakest hunter that has ever existed. He even managed to get himself injured and hospitalized in an E-ranked dungeon. So much so that they might as well create a new F-rank just for him. So if his widely known weak status it has become somewhat of a good sign whenever he is called in a dungeon raid since it means it is probably going to be a really easy one. Jin Wu heard every word they just said about him, but it's not like they are wrong since he really is just that weak. He gets called out by a woman called Juhi. And it seems Jinwoo knows her from a previous mission they had gone on together, but greetings aside, she is more worried about his newest set of injuries and asks him what could have happened this time. 
They sit down and Jinwu explains the embarrassing fact that he got injured in the lowest rank of the dungeons and the team didn't have a healer on hand because they thought it would be way too easy for any self-respecting hunter to ever get themselves injured, but they hadn't accounted for him, Jinwu's existence. Jui gets mad on his behalf, but Jinwu already knows that it wasn't their fault, it was his own for being so weak in the first place. The time to enter the dungeon has arrived and they are all about to enter the dungeon, so this man Song Chi suggests that he be out in the position of party leader for this expedition. No one is opposed to the idea, so he leads them all in, and before Jinwoo enters, he gets a friendly reminder to stick as close to the group as possible in order to not get hurt again. Jinwoo's only weapon is a small knife with very little magic power, and this is all of his meager earnings are able to afford him in the way of equipment, but he swears he will do his best regardless. Elsewhere, the president of a company is having a talk with his assistant. The demands from the public are as contradictory as ever. They demand that he finds a way to stop the dungeon breaks, but also want the items that are acquired from the dungeons, though it is not like he is in a position to complain about their requests since he makes his money by selling the items gotten from the dungeon. The crystals harvested from the corpses of magic beasts can be sold for money, but the process of gathering them is really bloody. Luckily, Jinwu has managed to get one on his own for the first time. However, in his celebration over the money he will get after he sells this gem, he leaves himself wide open and has to be brought back to reality by a call from Jui, warning him of an incoming attack. Jinwu manages to raise his knife in time to defend himself from the goblin's strike, but his knife merely breaks in the process. He barely manages to dodge the goblin's follow-up strikes, but as he tries to defend with his knife again, the cheap thing shatters and he ends up getting himself stabbed in the stomach. Jui wants to go help him, but Park tells him to stay back while he handles it, and even though he hasn't gone on a mission in a long time, he's still got it in him as he slashes the goblin to death in one strike. Jinwoo pulls the sword out of his stomach, which is not something a doctor would recommend, and Park tells him to recover, while he takes care of the next magical beasts in his place. He asks Jui to heal Jinwoo, while they've got the time, so she heads over to him and begins the process. She puts her hand over the gushing wound and starts healing him as a light gathers around her hands and Jinwoo seems to be recovering slightly. On the other side of the cave, Jinwoo can see the rest of the hunters actually doing their jobs and he probably feels like shit both because of his injury and the injury to his pride after he promised himself that he would do well this time. We get a look at the top of the line equipment and magic gems being sold in this world. All things that Jinwoo will never be able to enjoy in his lifetime. Mana crystals harvested from the dungeons can be used as weapons as well, but their effectiveness is inferior to that of magic gems. However, President Go has received a new government mandate that wants to use the mana crystals as a new form of energy production since it is safer than nuclear energy, but still more efficient than any other form of renewable energy that exists in their world, so it is the ideal source of energy. Thus, the government is researching methods to generate electricity from the use of magic gems and mana crystals, making hunters even more crucial to society at large. Meanwhile, in the dungeon, the party have just managed to take down a werewolf and are celebrating their victory over it, while Jinwoo is over in the corner getting healed up again, as he is the only one who managed to get seriously hurt. Jinwoo was on his side earlier, but now, after seeing how badly he keeps getting injured in fights, she is starting to question why he even became a hunter in the first place. If this keeps up, he's going to end up with injuries that are too severe for her to treat at some point. He apologizes, but Jui isn't interested in his apology. Instead, she wants him to be more careful with himself in the future. Jinwoo looks over to the rest of the hunters and they are busy splitting up the loot according to the work that was done in battle. And if we're talking about team contributions, then Jinwoo did basically nothing for the entire fight. So after this whole mission, all he has to show for it is a single E-rank magic gem and a broken dagger which he spent his life savings on. He is starting to reconsider coming out here and risking his life just to make no money, but then one guy on the team calls everyone's attention to a huge hole, and they all gather around to figure out what this thing is. It looks like a cave, but they are in a dungeon, so it is much more likely that happens to be a double dungeon. It's rare, but they've heard of it before, and their hunch is confirmed by the fact that they've already killed the dungeon boss, yet it hasn't started closing like a regular dungeon would. It seems like there will be more profit to be made deeper in the dungeon, but Song Chi tries to be the voice of reason and tells everyone that normal protocol is to inform the association of the double dungeon and follow the instructions that they give afterwards. The team doesn't want to do that since it would basically mean that they give up the rights to all the untapped loot that is probably waiting for them down there. Then Park says the words that never lead to anything good. It's just an f rank dungeon. What's the worst that could happen, and then his wife and child get brought up and how he needs to make more money and get back to them. Yeah, I'm calling it now, he's not making it back from this one. Song Shi understands the point they are trying to make, but he wants to listen to everyone's opinions before he makes a decision on the matter. 
The team members all speak up with a mix of approval of the plan to venture deeper and realization that this is a clear death flag. In total, there are six votes for going into the cave and six votes for going home. So someone needs to break that tie, and the only one left who hasn't voted is Jin Wu. The decision is left up to him, and while he is well aware that a D-ranked dungeon is insanely dangerous for him to be in, with his father missing, he is the only one in his family that can earn any money, and he's already got a ton of financial burdens. His mother is in the hospital, and his sister still has to go to college, so he can't stay broke forever. After he makes the decision to go into the dungeon, we cut away to a lab where people are getting tested for their magical powers. And outside in the waiting room, associations are waiting, ready to sign on any promising new hunters. And this rank hunter, Choi has told his people that regardless of age or gender, if there is a talented individual available to be recruited, then recruit them. Back in the dungeon, the party has been walking for 40 minutes now with no success in finding anything of value yet, and the portal to a dungeon closes after an hour since the dungeon boss was defeated. So that means they only have another 20 minutes before they run out of time altogether. Jinwoo apologizes to Juhi for making the decision to come down here when he knew she wanted to go back, but she isn't even mad about having to come down here. What she is mad about is that Jinwoo is still being such a reckless idiot with his body by deciding to come down into such a dangerous, unexplored dungeon, even though he was getting injured so badly earlier. That goblin stab could have been the end of him if she weren't around to heal him, and he realizes that now, so he gives it some serious thought. Juvi sees that Jinwoo is finally taking her safety concerns seriously, and that gets her to calm down a bit. But to make it up to her, she wants Jinwoo to get dinner with her after this, and Jinwoo gets flustered. But before he can give an answer, the party arrives at the boss room. They enter, and I'm sure you are all familiar with this room with the giant statues. They are at a loss for what they are supposed to do here, but find some writing on the walls. While it is being read by Song Chi, Juvi gets freaked out because she is pretty sure the eyes of the statue just moved. The doors to the room suddenly slam shut, and one member of the team who didn't want to come in the first place recognizes that something is wrong and tries to leave, but his exit is cut short as he is cut in half by one of the guard's statues. Everyone starts freaking out because not only did someone just die, he was taken out in an instant with power that none of them can handle. Jim looks back to the main statue, hoping that it doesn't move as well, but to his horror, it looks back at him. Jinwoo has lived through enough near-death experiences to know that this is one of them, so he yells for everyone to get down before it is too late. The giant statue unleashes a death ray that Jinwoo just barely managed to evade along with Juhi, but many others aren't so lucky and end up charred. Yet even if he got lucky this time, Jinwoo is sure that he will be killed sooner or later. The people panic and instinctually feel like they should run away, but from what they have seen happen so far, they are sure that they will be killed the second they move. Song yells out for everyone to stay exactly where they are, and Jinwoo checks on Juhi, who is thankfully still in one piece, but unconscious for the moment. Song thanks Jinwoo for his earlier warning when he shouted for everyone to get down since it saved them all. But it's not like he knew what was going to happen or anything, all he knew was that it was going to be bad. Jinwoo soon notices that Song didn't manage to escape that attack unharmed and has a lot of bleeding from his arm because his arm is just gone. He says he can bear the pain for now, but asks Jinwoo to help him stop the bleeding for now. Normally, he would have asked Yui to treat him since she is the healer here, but no offense, she's kind of a wimp when it comes to seriously dangerous situations, so she's curled up in the fetal position over there. That is the reason that she only ever goes on low-level raids despite being a B-ranked healer. Personally, Song has been on a few B-ranked missions, and he can say with certainty that this thing is way above B-rank. It might be A or even S for that matter, so they have no chance of beating it. He recalls the writing on the wall which said all who enter must worship the god, then praise the god and believe in the god. Those who fail to do this will not leave alive, so Jinwoo deduces that the god in question must be that statue. There is no way that the statue sees them as its opponent since it isn't attacking them, so Song suggests that they just wait out the worst of it and look for an opening to escape. But not everyone is on board with this plan. This guy isn't going to sit around and just wait to be killed. His life was going too well for him to let it end now. He finally signed a contract with a good association, and he even got the new Jordans on sale so no matter what he's going to make it out of here. The dude charges up and dashes away and it seems like he's going to. Oh, never mind. Well, at least the Jordans are okay, but I can't say the same for the rest of the guy. For the others that didn't move, that display just cemented the fact that this thing could easily kill them all if it wanted to. It is just choosing not to do so for some reason right now. But the question is why? Why hasn't it killed them yet if it has the power to do so to anything? Choosing not to attack makes it different from the other magical beasts that exist inside the dungeons, so Jinwoo thinks back to the first command on the wall of this room which said to worship the god. But to know if his theory is right, there is something he needs to check first, 
so he begins to stand up despite knowing it is dangerous. Song tries to stop him, but Jin Wu's eyes show that he is determined to make it through this alive. He slowly rises to his feet, and as he does this, the eyes of the statue begin to glow as it is about to fire its laser beam at him. Jin Wu immediately ducks back into a crouching position, and as he does, the statue's eyes stop glowing. This confirms his theory, so he yells out to everyone that they must bow to the statue. They don't understand what he means by that, but from what he has seen so far, the statue only attacks if your head is past a certain height, so if you keep your head low to the ground, you'll be safe from it. That is probably what the first command on the wall meant when it said to worship the god. Jin Wu bows his head to the statue, and with no better options, everyone follows his lead, hoping that his plan actually works. Jin Wu was correct in his assumption as the eyes of the statue stopped glowing altogether, but then you see, that's where the real trouble began. That smile. That damn smile. Park is creeped out by the statue's face, but seeing that its expression changed, he decides to take a leap of faith and stand up to see if anything happens when he does, and surprisingly, there are no death beams shot his way, so believes they have cleared the challenge and are free to go home. But just as everyone was celebrating their survival, the second health bar popped up and the statue started moving again. And this time, it gets up from its chair, so they are even more panicked than before. Song turns to Jin Wu and asks if he has any more ideas to help them get through this, but he doesn't have an instruction manual on this kind of thing. The best he can think of is the second command that said to praise the god, so they must need to praise it in order to stop it from attacking. One man from the back steps up and tells everyone that he has studied traditional folklore, so he knows how to praise god. He gets down on his knees and starts praying to the statue while everyone stands back and waits to see if the statue reacts to his praise. The statue definitely reacted, but instead of stopping its attack, it gave the guy the rumbling treatment and turned him into a puddle. One of the girls can handle the gore she has just witnessed, so her knees give out and she falls to the floor, only to become the statue's next victim, as it stomps her into pace as well. Song yells for everyone to scatter as fast as they can so that the statue can't get them all in one stomp. So they all begin running and Jin Woo grabs Juhi, who is still frozen in fear. Park is running for his life and thinking that he can't let himself die here, but let's be real, as soon as he started talking about his pregnant wife and kid, we knew he wasn't making it out of this alive. He runs over to one corner of the room and tells everyone that it should be safe over here, but he had forgotten about the smaller statue guards that were there and that they can attack as well. So before Song can warn him, Park gets his body split in two, and I don't think he's going to get to see his wife again. Jinmu continues to run across the room while wondering what exactly the command to praise it was talking about. There isn't exactly much to praise about that thing in the first place, but Junwoo has to figure it out because he got Jui into this mess and has to find a way to get her back out alive. He looks to the edge of the room and the statues that are all lined up against the wall. One wields a spear, another with an axe, and various other weapons, which could easily kill them. But then there is one with a trumpet, and it seems like the safest option, so Jinwoo yells for Song to go stand under the statue with a musical instrument, and as he does, it doesn't try to kill him and just starts playing music instead. He yells for the others to get to the statues that are holding musical instruments, and as they do, the statues begin playing and they seem to be safe. Jinwoo drags Jui over to a statue with a drum, but doesn't start playing immediately, so thinking quickly, he guesses that two people aren't allowed to stand under the same statue, so he tells Jui to stay here while he runs to get to another statue. As he runs off, Juvi is left standing alone under the drum statue, and it begins to play, but as Jinwoo is running, the giant statue begins to chase after him and is inching closer with each colossal step. Jinwoo has the final musical statue in his sight, but the giant statue has its foot over his head, so he is moments away from becoming human jam. Luckily, as the foot came down, Jinwoo got out of the way and managed to save himself from being squished by Dark Souls rolling, but in his haste, he had rolled into the statue holding a shield, and this one was going to attack, so before he knew it, he found himself with a shield being brought down upon him. A dust cloud is kicked up and Jui screams out in tears, believing that Jinwoo has just died, but it's not over yet, and as long as there is still breath in his lungs, Jinwoo will continue to push forward, even if he has to crawl. The giant raises its foot once more to squash him, but luckily, Jinwoo managed to make it to the last musical statue while narrowly missing the giant's step, and as he does, the giant stops chasing after him and returns to its seat. Jui runs over to Jinwoo's side to check if he is alright, and he says he is fine and I'm no doctor, but it looks like you're missing a leg there. Jinwoo hadn't even realized he lost his leg due to the adrenaline coursing through his veins, so Juby tries to heal him, but with all the healing she's been doing today, it is starting to take its toll on her, so Jinwoo tells her to stop. She remains determined to heal him while the others assess the situation they are in now. It looks like it is finally over, 
So the survivors start blaming Song for agreeing to come down here even though half of them voted to come here. But now isn't the time to be playing the blame game since there is still one command left to be followed. The giant statue raises its hand, and an altar appears in the center of the room. The rest of the group is confused when they see it, but Jinwoo correctly identifies it, and says it is commonly used in mythology to offer living sacrifices to God. The final command is to believe in God, so it is pretty clear what they are supposed to do here, and Kim wastes no time in telling Song to go offer himself as a sacrifice, because they all blame him for bringing them down here. Song doesn't fight it and agrees to go and have himself offered, but he says he wants to go alone in case it might be dangerous for them. As Song walks to his death, Jinwoo thinks about how this isn't entirely his fault since the group voted to come down here and moreover, Jinwoo was the one who had the deciding vote. As Song walked into the altar, a flame was ignited, but he was still alive. He doesn't know what he is supposed to be doing, so he asks if there is anything else that is needed. Jinwoo asks two of the other people with him to help him up so he can go check the altar, but he assures them that it is safe since nothing happened to Song. The two agree to help him get there, and as they enter the altar, their more flames are ignited. Song asks if Jinwoo has any idea what this is supposed to mean, but he doesn't have a definite answer yet. If they wait here, then they may eventually be rescued, but this is the seventh day since this dungeon was opened, meaning that it will soon become a dungeon break and the magical beasts from within this dungeon will be able to pass through and enter the human world. This is why people try to clear a dungeon boss before the time limit is up, so if they fail here, then that giant statue will be able to enter their world and cause untold mayhem. For now, they need to see what happens next, so Jinwoo asks the others to come into the altar so they can move on with clearing this test. They agree, and as they all enter, flames ignite on all sides of the altar, and another ring of blue flames forms around it. This causes the door to open, but it also makes the weapon-wielding statues begin to move. Jinwoo notices that these statues do not move as long as you are looking at them, so he asks everyone to keep their eyes on the statues. However, this one girl has had enough and throws everyone under the no-bus to save herself as she sprints out the door. It may seem selfish, but she did manage to make it out, so the others start to think there is hope of escaping. Jinwoo, on the other hand, isn't fooled. The boss music hasn't stopped playing yet, so that open door has to be a trap. The first command was to worship, then it was to praise, and the third one is to believe, so it must mean they have to stay here until the timer of the blue flames runs out, and if that is the case, the open door is only there to tempt them into leaving the circle. Jinwoo tries to tell the others that they need to stay here so they can keep the statues from closing in, but they had already had their wills broken by this dungeon, so when an escape route has presented itself, there is no way they would be willing to stay. Kim tells Jinwoo that he is incredibly thankful to Jinwoo because it is all thanks to him that they have managed to survive this long. But he has had enough of this, and just wants to go back home and see his wife, so he is going to leave through the door. The only ones left are Jinwoo, Judy, and Song, and Jinwoo is struggling to keep his eyes on all the statues at once, so they keep inching closer and closer, and he is starting to think he might have been wrong about the objective. Song speaks up and says that he wants Juhi and Jinwoo to leave through that door. He believes that the door won't close as long as one person remains on the altar, so he wants them to escape since they are still young and have their whole futures ahead of themselves. However, Jinwoo has lost a leg, and Juhi has lost all strength in her legs, so there is no way the two of them will be able to make it out together. Thus, Jinwoo asks Song to take Judy and get her to safety while he stays behind. Song agrees to his request, and though Juhi was against it, Song knocks her out and takes her to presume safety as Jinwoo wanted. Jinwoo is okay with how things ended, the only regret he has is that if he had known things would end like this, then he would have taken out more life insurance. The armed statues close in on him and begin to attack, severing an arm and leaving him at death's door, and Jinwoo can do nothing but wish he were strong enough to fight back against these things. He had his own dreams, his aspirations in life, so why does he have to die here? He gets stabbed through the chest and thrown onto the altar as the statue prepares to finish him off with its sword, and Jinwoo, completely powerless to do anything, just sits there and awaits death. But as the sword comes down on him and ends his life, a timer countdown ends and a status screen appears before Jinwoo. It's a quest, and it says that he will die if he doesn't accept it, so him not wanting to die yet, we see him accept. Jinwoo wakes up startled in a hospital bed as he looks down and realizes that his hand and foot are still attached to his body somehow. Not only that, but the stab wound in his chest is also gone, so he begins to wonder what happened. He thinks the whole thing might have been a dream because he knows his insurance wouldn't cover healing treatment and with how often he gets injured, his premiums already cost an arm and a leg anyway. Just then, these two men in suits enter the room and introduce themselves as people from the association surveillance unit, and they would like to have a word with him. Jin Wu is informed that he has been unconscious for three days now, 
So he asked about the condition of the others, so the men tell them that Song is still alive and well, but he lost an arm in the dungeon, so he may be unable to continue his expeditions in future, and as for Jui, she is suffering severe psychological damage and I don't blame her since all that happened and she didn't even want to be there in the first place. Only six people made it out of the dungeon alive, and while it is true that hunters sign up for the job knowing the dangers, casualties like this almost never happen. Yet, when another hunter team was sent in, all they found was Junwoo laying there unharmed and no temple or statue to speak of. Normally, if the stories of the survivors had any inconsistencies or if there weren't corpses all over the area they may have been suspicious of Junwoo, but with things as they are, they speculate that Junwoo may have had a reawakening in the dungeon. Usually, a hunter's abilities are set from the moment they awaken their powers, but on some rare occasions, hunters have a reawakening and surpass their limits, becoming A or even S rank at times. Jinwu is starting to get excited at the prospect that he is one of those cases, and the men place a magic measuring device in front of him to confirm if their speculations are correct. The surveillance team believe that if what the survivors reported is to be believed, then those monsters that killed people with ease could easily be S rank. So there should have been no way that the lowest of all hunters could survive against them. The monsters also disappear altogether, so there is a chance Jinwu may have become an incredibly powerful hunter due to his experience in the dungeon. However, as they measure his magic, the score only comes out to a 10. 10 out of what? I don't know, but I know no Asian family would be happy with that score. Jinwu was all excited, thinking he was about to have his main character moment, but the suit guys just looked disappointed that they wasted their time on such a pointless endeavor. They immediately leave, but they are still astonished by how trash Jinwoo is compared to a regular hunter. Even a baseline E rank hunter would be able to average a 69 on the magic test. But if he is so weak, then how on earth did he manage to survive in there? Jinwoo is disappointed by the news that he still isn't special yet, but he can't help but wonder why the two suit guys didn't bother asking him anything about that floating screen right in front of his face. It seems like something they may be interested in talking about, but then again, he may be the only who can see it. This means one of two things, either he has gone crazy, or he is special now. He plays around with the screen to see if he can learn anything useful about it, but then he gets a flashback to the moment in the dungeon when he saw this exact same screen pop up. His sister soon comes into the room, relieved to see her brother is still in one piece, but annoyed at the same time that he keeps putting himself in such great danger. As she is yelling at him, all Jinwoo can think about is how grateful he is that he gets to see his wonderful sister's cute face again. He apologizes for making her worry so much, then asks her if she can see the screen in front of him, but she can't and wonders if he might have some brain damage. Jinwoo brushes it off and starts asking her about what one would usually do if they wanted to read a message. She finds the question odd but tells him he would just need to open the message box, and as he does this, he sees something pop up on his screen, telling him to begin his training. Jinwoo seems to be fine. A little odd but fine, so Jina leaves him for the meantime and goes to meet her friend who has been waiting this entire time. Once she is gone, Jinwoo begins looking through the windows and learns that this screen is a system designed to help players develop their skills. But if you fail to do what the system requires of you, then a penalty will be issued. Jinwoo doesn't understand any of it, so he just accepts the quest of daily strength training to see what happens. The strength training is enough to make a man go bald, but Jinwoo doesn't take it seriously since he is still hospitalized, and there is no way he would be able to do 100 push-ups, sit-ups, and squats in a single day, or run 10 kilometers. So he just decides to ignore it and go to sleep while the timer keeps ticking away. On the streets, the two suits give their report to President about Jin Wu still being a loser, but that still leaves the question of what happened in that dungeon and who cleared it. This is going to have to be investigated further, so the surveillance team is going to be having a long day dealing with this. Meanwhile, a promising new hunter, Miss Cha, is being given the opportunity to participate in the next B rank dungeon raid as an instructor. She isn't too confident in her ability to teach others how to not suck at their job. But she is assured that all she needs to do is showcase her amazing skills and the others will learn from her example as she goes. Their hunter guild may be one of the best in Korea, but when it comes to the international hunting scene, they are koi fish in a pond of sharks, and while it is impossible to raise the rank of an individual, it is possible to train as a group and hone the guild's combatability so they will be ready for any new threats. At that very moment, a new gate appears right in the middle of the road, and now hunters have to be called in to handle it. Meanwhile, Jimwoo is in his history bed sleeping really well and ignoring the calls to go to the gym, when all of a sudden, his screen pops up and shows that he has failed his One Punch Man training quest, so a penalty will be issued. But when you think of a penalty, you may think of losing some points or being put on probation, but Jinwoo just gets chucked into a desert. Good luck, buddy. While he is still trying to figure out what just happened to him, this giant worm comes up behind him, 
and his new goal is to just survive for four hours while this thing tries to kill him. Back in the hospital room, a nurse has just realized that Jinwoo has gone missing from his room, and it is usually bad if a hospital loses a patient so they start looking for him. Meanwhile, Jinwoo has been running for his life in this desert full of sandworms, and I'm honestly surprised he has managed to last this long against them. His four hours are almost up, but he is running out of steam really quickly, so he doesn't know if he can handle any more of this. The timer counts down to zero and Jinwoo is returned to his hospital room looking like a man who just ran for four hours straight, but he has managed to clear his penalty quest and survive, so he's at least got that going for him. Some time passes and Jinwoo isn't going to make the same mistake again, so early that morning, he puts on a tracksuit and heads out to start his running. Meanwhile, Juyu is just contacted about that rank dungeon gate that spawned in the middle of the street, but she still isn't willing to go on anything dungeon raids after what happened last time, and the guy calling her understands that she has been through a lot, so he tells her it is fine as she doesn't want to go. To cheer her up a little, the guy tells her that he heard that Jinwoo has woken up in the hospital, and that does put a smile on her face. Later that day, she goes over to the hospital to check up on Jinwoo, but she is a bit hesitant, because while she didn't want to, she did end up leaving Jinwoo there to die. In the hall, she overhears some nurses talking about Jinwoo and how he's been going out and running ever since that day he went missing for four hours. They know hunters are able to heal faster than most people, but he was in a coma a few days ago. He said something about wanting to get back in shape and hearing how hard he is working on himself. Juhi becomes apprehensive and walks away. On the hospital grounds, Jinwoo has completed his 10k run for the day and takes a seat on a nearby bench to rest. And it's been four days since Jinwoo woke up and he has learned a few things since then. First, the screen he is seeing is actually real, so he isn't crazy, and two, the quests are not to be taken lightly. But once it is completed, he receives three kinds of rewards. He is able to recover instantly from all the fatigue he got from his running, and he is given ability points, which he is able to distribute to any one of his stats. For instance, adding points to his strength literally makes him feel stronger instantly. He has also got a skill and inventory window, but remember, no one else can see any of this, so to them, he's pretty much crazy. Finally, the last reward he receives is a random loot box, but it just keeps giving him useless junk. However, this time he gets a key and its description says it can be used to teleport into an instance dungeon. He isn't sure what an instance dungeon is, but from what has happened so far, he can tell that it is going to be dangerous, and it will probably help him get stronger. Four years ago, his mother was diagnosed with a sickness called external sleep disease. It was thought to be caused by an excessive exposure to mana, but the best modern medicine can do is keeping her alive for a little while longer. Even back then, insurance was hella expensive, so Jinwoo started a job as a construction worker to pay for the treatment. But then one day, he felt something strange and discovered that he had awakened as a hunter, even if he was a shitty one. Being a hunter made it easier to pay for his mother's treatment, so he stuck with it despite being absolutely doo-doo butter at it, but now has a chance to actually become strong, and there is no way he is going to pass up on something like this. He heads to the location of the instance dungeon and takes out the key to head in. So as he puts the key in the lock, a doorway opens and he is allowed entry. He steps into the stairway and the entrance seals up behind him, so Jinwoo begins to worry that this might be a situation like what happened in the double dungeon. It seems like he is in a separate dimension, so he has no choice but to clear the dungeon if he wants to be able to get out of here. He was getting his ass beat by a goblin last week and now he has to clear a dungeon by himself. He isn't confident he can do it, but he's stuck here until he does, so he has to try. As he walks through the dungeon, he gets jumped by three goblins, but this time, he has the power of character development on his side, so although he struggles a bit, he is able to eventually take down the goblins one by one. He can tell that he has gotten stronger, but goblins aren't the only thing he has to worry about as a wolf jumps out from behind him and shatters his knife. His legs are quaking from fear, but he can't afford to let himself get injured too badly, because there is no healer here to save his ass, but how will he manage to deal with this wolf? The wolf monster lunges at Jinwoo, so he is forced to dodge out of the way and I don't know how. But in the process of dodging, he manages to accidentally hit a triple backflip into a handstand. There is no reason this man should be able to do a whole acrobatic routine mid-fight, but he can tell that his body has become lighter than it was before. The wolf charges at him again and still having no weapon in hand, he decides to take a chance and see what else his body can accidentally do. The wolf leaps at him and Jinwoo feeds it a fist that sends it flying straight back into a wall. Jim Wu is surprised at the amount of force he just produced from his hand, and it is still visibly smoking from the bagassery just pulled off. But the wolf is still stronger than him and gets back up to continue fighting. He tries throwing punches at the wolf again, but that metal jaw is allowing the wolf to tank the punches and push forward. 
At this rate, it's only a matter of time before the wolf catches him off guard and rips his body to pieces, so if he wants any hope of killing this thing, he's going to need to get a weapon. Jinwu has a sudden realization that he literally has access to an inventory, so he pulls it up and starts pulling a sword out as the wolf charges again. He makes it just in time to slash the wolf's head in two with the long sword he acquired. He has no idea why this sword is in his inventory, but he isn't going to question it when he is still alive only because he got it. Two more wolves show up to attack, but Jinwu has nothing to fear as long as he has a weapon to cut them down with. Unfortunately for him, his sword is now stuck in the ground so he is back to square one. He manages to free it and strikes at one of the wolves, but it catches the sword in its mouth and holds onto it. Jinwu just got this sword so he isn't about to let it get taken by this mutt and side kicks the wolf before using the sword to slice straight through its head. The other wolf witnessed what just happened and decided that this wasn't worth it anymore so it runs off. Now that Jinwu has finally gotten a chance to relax, he takes a breather and collects his thoughts. This is when he notices that the status screen says he is now level 2. This is the first time he has leveled up since he got this screen, but that's probably because this is the first time he has had actual combat since then. It looks like his stats get a point increase every time he levels up, giving a total of 5 stat points, while his daily workout quest only gives 3. His capabilities will go up with the number of stat points he is able to acquire so he is eager to find out how much he improves with each additional point. Even intelligence and perception are quantified on the status screen, but he doesn't really understand how those will come into play in his combat, so he decides to stick to something simple for now and dumps all his stats into strength. He gets up to go see if the wolves have any magic gems in them so he can make some money off this, but as he inspects the corpse, he gets an item instead. A new screen pops up and shows an item shop is available, but as Jinwoo tries to buy something, he is informed that he can't do that because he doesn't have the appropriate level or funds to purchase anything. For now, he decides to just sell the item he got, and as he does, it disappears from his hand while his balance is credited with 20 gold coins. He doesn't really know how much gold coins would be worth in relation to real-world money, but since this is just an E-ranked dungeon, it can't be worth much. Now that he's rested for a bit, he gets back up to continue fighting his way through the dungeon as he won't be able to escape unless he eventually defeats the dungeon boss. He can't let this drive on for too long, so he needs to start looking for the boss or he will eventually run out of foo here. Still, even if this is only an E-ranked dungeon, it would still be difficult for him to defeat a boss all by himself as he is now. Although, he may have a chance if he keeps leveling up as he has done so far, but with how things are going, he might end up dead before he has enough stats to challenge the boss. That wolf that ran away earlier went to call all its boys, so an entire pack of steel wolves have come out from the shadows to kill Jinwoo. He tries to keep himself calm and says there is nothing to be afraid of as he will live as long as he is able to avoid getting killed. He gets into the mix and manages to take out a couple of the wolves, so he is starting to gain a little more confidence in his abilities. He has always struggled to get by and care for his sick mother while was a weakling, but he has gotten a second chance at life now, and if it will make him stronger, then he will do whatever it takes. He slashes at the wolves over and over again, killing one after the other and leveling up over the course of the battle. Thus, by the end of the battle, Jinwoo acquires the title of Wolf Assassin and stands proud over their corpses, for he is strong. He may be stronger now, but the same doesn't go for that sword as it is at the end of its usable lifetime. Weapons don't last very long considering how much they cost to buy, but thankfully, it looks like the battle is over for now. Jinwoo takes some time to look over his inventory and takes note of the items he has acquired from his slaughter. He has gotten 34 wolf fangs, a robe, and a teleportation stone, so if he wishes to leave the dungeon now, he may do so at any moment. However, he doesn't want to just leave when he doesn't know when next he will get the chance to level up this easily. There is no guarantee that this dungeon will continue to exist after he leaves, so he decides that it would be best to go back in and see it through to the end. Meanwhile, Outside Jinwoo's instance dungeon, Juby receives a call about a dungeon break that recently occurred in the area. This is at least somewhat due to her refusing to go in and help clear it as their healer, so now they are trying to assemble a team of hunters to deal with the monsters that are spilling out onto the city streets, and they are in desperate need of healers, so the hunter association is requesting that she join the battle. Juby still has her fears to deal with, but after seeing Jinwoo working so hard even after the trauma-inducing double dungeon incident, she decides that she needs to put some effort in as well and accepts the request. Meanwhile, Jinwoo continues to fight his way through his dungeon and is leveling up as he goes. He has realized that the higher his level gets, the easier his fights with the monsters here become. That also led him to make another discovery. The color of the names of the monsters actually have a meaning to them. White means they are weaker than him. 
While an orange name would mean that the monster is on the same level as him, and red means it is stronger than him. The wolves whose names were initially marked with red have now turned white, which means that he has definitely grown stronger than he was when he initially came into this dungeon. But even with his higher power level, Jimu isn't confident that he has what it takes to beat the monster down in the depths of the dungeon. However, he can't put it off any longer as no matter how many weak monsters he kills, he isn't gaining any more levels and his sword isn't going to hold up much longer either, so he needs to finish this soon. Jinwoo descends the long staircase and comes into a wide open boss area. He gets distracted by the scene and doesn't notice the monster coming straight for him until he gets knocked back into a wall. The force of the impact causes Jinwoo's sword to finally bite the dust, so he is lacking an effective means of combat once more and despite all the leveling up he did in this dungeon, the snake's name is still orange. The snake is covered in scales, so what's left of the sword will be useless against it, and trying to box it would be even more pointless, so he starts to wonder what he could possibly do here. The snake charges at him with great speed, and he is forced to parry the attack with the broken sword. He has no choice other than to try to weaken the snake's defenses so he can do some damage, but that is easier said than done when the snake's scales are thicker than Judy. The snake swings around and tries to bite Jinwu, so he goes on the run and gets ragdolled all the way across the arena. He may have gotten stronger, but it still isn't enough for him to beat this monster as he continues to get smacked back and forth by the snake. However, Jimu refuses to give up and charges forward once more parrying the snake's attacks. He then gets on top of the snake and since his sword can't penetrate its scales, he decides to go for an alternative attack and digs his hands into the snake's body. He put all his stats into strength so he is sure that he should be able to kill the snake here and now. So despite the snake's best efforts to knock him off, Jinwoo eventually crushes it to death and has successfully cleared the dungeon. As a reward for clearing the dungeon, he receives a dagger made from the snake's fangs which has a paralysis effect. But the other item he got, the snake's venom gland, is a bit too scary to use since although it allows for a 20% reduction in damage taken, has the drawback of reducing his strength by 35%, so he just keeps it in storage for now. Having defeated the boss, Jinwoo receives a notification and the instant's dungeon begins to fade away, returning Jinwoo to the regular train station. He exits the station but finds it a little weird that there is no one around at all. A few moments later, he gets confronted by a soldier who tells him that it is too dangerous for civilians to be in this area, but the soldier soon realizes that Jinwoo must be a hunter and apologizes for his mistake. He offers to show Jinwoo the way to the battle, and Jinwoo, who is still confused at this point, agrees to go along. The dungeon break that caused this state of emergency has mostly been taken care of, but there is still one big monster left to take care of, and with his improved perception ability, Jin Wu is able to sense the monster boss all the way over there. We see a giant golem wreaking havoc on the street, but the normal people who should be getting away from here for their safety are more interested in getting some photos for the gram. The hunters that are fighting the boss are having a hard time. Jin Wu is watching the team get their asses handed to themselves from the back of the crowd, and he can tell that this team was hastily assembled, so the teamwork is almost non-existent. On top of that, they are mostly made up of low-ranked hunters. They've also got two B-rank healers and one B-rank healer, who he then recognizes as Jui. Jui, who got called in, is still not completely comfortable with the danger of battle, so her actions are far sloppier than they should be and she is unable to heal anyone. Seeing that they are in trouble and this boss should be weaker than the one he just fought, Jimu believes he should be able to lend a hand and throws his broken sword at the golem. His attack completely shattered the barrier of the golem, so the rest of the hunters are able to take advantage of the opening and kill the golem. Then, before anyone spots him, Jinwoo walks away into the night. In the hospital, Jinwoo has been getting a lot of attention lately as the nurses have gotten a look at his muscles and to sum up their opinion of him. They would let him smash. One of the nurses enters his room for the routine checkup, and even though Jinwoo is the one covered in sweat, I guarantee that she is more drenched. And don't blame her because Jinwoo has had the glow up of the century. The nurse regains her composure and informs him that he is back to full health, so he can be discharged from the hospital. Jimwu thanks her and proceeds to make his way down to the front desk, but before he leaves, the nurse shoots her shot and asks him for his phone number. However, Jinwu is still unaware of the sheer levels of Reese he's emanating, so he just assumes she needs it for a medical report or something. We cut to an interview of one of the Seven's rank hunters in Korea, Bak Yuhu. That in and of itself is an impressive achievement, but the people want to know what he does with his time when he isn't risking his life in a dungeon. He answers that he trains every day, and since he used to be a firefighter, he is accustomed to maintaining his physical prime so he can spring into action at a moment's notice. Gina was watching this interview on TV. Before she realizes that it has gotten pretty late, so she might end up being late for school. She calls out for Jinwoo to let him know that she's going out, and he comes out to see her off. 
She tells him that there's some food in the fridge for him. But then she looks down and notices for the first time that her brother has gotten kind of hot. He has also gotten taller since she last saw him, but it's nice to see him looking healthy. She prepares to leave, but Jinwoo calls her back because she forgot her umbrella. After making sure she's got everything she needs, she heads off to school and Jin Woo goes back into the living room to take a look at his status screen. He's completed most of his daily training requirements, but he'll still have to go for a run later. He's sure that his recent growth is probably due to his increased stats, and if he kept it up like this, he could probably become a bodybuilder or something. He's still got some stat points left over from the instance dungeon, so he is contemplating what he should spend them on. Putting them into strength would be his initial thought, but there's no point in having high damage if you are unable to hit your opponent in the first place. So for that reason, he decides to put his remaining points into agility. Just then, Jimu receives a call from his landlord, and he already knows this is about the rent not being paid yet. He can't help it since he was in the hospital for a while, but he promises that he will have the payment ready as soon as possible. Jinwoo isn't sure if what he is experiencing is really a reawakening, but right now, he is able to kill goblins with no trouble, so making enough money for rent shouldn't be a problem for him anymore. However, that doesn't mean it is going to be easy either as to make it a decent amount of money, he would need to go into one of the higher-ranked dungeons. However, according to his hunter card, he is still only an E rank, so there's no way they would let him join an official party. He might want to get his rank reevaluated as that will allow him to get into higher-ranked dungeons and earn a lot more money. But then again, it would also draw a lot of attention to him. People who have reawakened are rare enough, but he is likely the first hunter that is able to continuously grow stronger. Something like this will definitely draw a lot of unwanted attention, so if possible he thinks it would be best to keep his power hidden until he has at least gotten strong enough to keep the haters at bay. However, that's not to say that there are no options available for making money right now as he receives a notification on his phone of a party that will accept him. Jin Wu runs to the gate to get his training done for the day, and once he arrives, He's greeted by this man and his team. One of the other team members points out that Jin Wu is pretty famous for being the weakest hunter ever. The others find that hilarious, but Dong Suk tells them to knock it off as he's a part of their team for today and deserves some respect. Jin Wu asks if he is really okay with having an E rank hunter participate in this raid. So Dong Suk assures him that it is fine since they just need to make up for the number of participants that are required to hold a dungeon raid. They need at least eight hunters to take on a C rank dungeon and they are prepared to pay him 2 million just for coming in with them. It's a pretty good deal for him. So they just ask that he carry the bags for them while they hunt. They will be going in without a healer, which makes Jin Wu uneasy. But Dong Suk assures him that it will be fine. So Jin Wu signs the death waiver and hands the contract back to him. And it would seem that he's not the only one who is there as a stand-in, as this guy Yu Jin Ho walks up and introduces himself. He's only D rank, but his father's wallet is SS rank, so he has that pay to win build. The party gets their gear ready and begins to enter the dungeon one after another, and Jin Ho refuses to shut up for even half a second while walking next to Jin Woo. They get to the gate, and it is really huge. But according to the Hunters Association, it is still only a C rank dungeon, so Dong Suk assures everyone that there is nothing to fear. They all enter the dungeon and find a pitch black cave with no monsters inside. They've never seen anything like this before, especially since dungeons are known to always have glow stones in the walls. They headed in a little deeper, but they still haven't spotted any monsters, so the others begin to wonder what is going on. As Jinho asks him if he has any idea what is happening, Jin Woo hears something off in the distance. It's not that there aren't any monsters in the area, it's that they are hiding in wait for an ambush. He thinks quickly and realizes that these monsters enjoy hiding in the darkness for their prey, and considering their environment, he yells out to the others that the monsters are insect types. They still can't see anything coming their way, so they are starting to panic a little, but just before they can get ambushed, Jin Wu is able to detect one of the monsters and warns everyone that the attack will be coming from above them. Hundreds of insects pour out of the tunnels above them, but thanks to Jin Wu's warning, the team was prepared and have re-established their formation to defend themselves. After taking out the initial wave of insects, Dong Suk calls for the team to move forward while Jin Wu stands back and analyses their strategy. They seem to have known each other for a really long time since they worked so well together, then there's Jin Ho who lacks skill but has high-level equipment to fall back on. The hunt is going smoothly, but something still feels off to him. The leader calls for the team to begin harvesting the gemstones while he goes over to Jin Wu and thanks him for his help in figuring out where the monsters were coming from. One of the others calls Dong Suk over to take a look at a few ants that got bludgeoned to death. It doesn't look like damage from any of the weapons they have on hand, nor does it look like magic damage, so they assume there were other monsters in here that are strong enough to take out these things. However, that was the work of Jin Wu, and right now, he is starting to get suspicious of Dong Suk. 
The party continues through the dungeon, and it is pretty big for a C-ranked dungeon. But in the end, the size has nothing to do with the rating of the dungeon. It's the level of magic energy that is being radiated from it that is important, so in this case, a dungeon is big, but mostly empty. Jinho asks Jinwoo if he is really okay with carrying all that equipment through this huge dungeon, but he is fine with it. Something has been bugging him about Dong Suk's party ever since they entered the dungeon. They are a battle-hardened party with great teamwork, yet they don't have a healer and need to fill quotas by hiring random hunters. The group keeps coming across insects that are half-dead, so they know they must be getting close to the dungeon boss room. They have their suspicions confirmed when they come across a large amount of spiderwebs stuck to the wall of the cave. They push forward and eventually find a treasure trove of mana crystals all over the place. This could easily amount to over a billion in profits and even Dong Suk's brother, who is much more successful than him, would be jealous of such a huge haul. Jin Ho asks to see the contract that Jin Woo signed and brings to Dong Suk's attention that he didn't say anything about Jin Woo receiving a share of mine mana crystals, so the profits should be split evenly among them. Dong Suk replies with the fakest smile ever and says he's okay with that, but first they've got to deal with the dungeon boss that is currently hanging overhead. Once the boss is defeated, the gate will close after an hour, so to maximize profits, Dong Suk wants them to mine out all the crystals before they challenge it. Luckily, the spider seems to be asleep, so this is the perfect opportunity to start mining the stones. Now they just need to get the mining equipment that they just so happen to leave in the car. They ask Jin Woo and Jin Ho to stay behind and keep an eye on things here. And this is definitely not a trap or anything. Would a guy with that smile lie to you? Jinwoo knows what's up and thinks about how these guys need eight members to go on raids, yet they haven't once managed to get people to join them for multiple raids even with the deal they are offering. That can only mean one thing, and it is clear that Dong Suk is up to no good. As the party was leaving, they set off an explosion that sealed off the entrance to the boss room. Jinho realizes they are being abandoned to their deaths and blames himself for bringing up the unfair contract but those guys were planning to have them killed all along, so the contract didn't do much. For now, they've got to figure out a way to deal with a boss monster. For an E-rank hunter, a C-rank boss should be literally unbeatable, but Jinwoo has been through much worse, so he is sure he can handle this thing. As the C-rank hunters exit the dungeon, the others ask Dong Suk why he had to make it so complicated when they could have easily just killed the low-rank hunters like they always do. But Dong Suk knew what he was doing and said it wouldn't have been worth it to fight them while they were right in front of the boss. If they had woken it up, then they wouldn't have been able to collect the gems in the cave. But this way, the monster would probably just kill the two weaklings, and after having a nice meal, sleep enough so they could mine out the crystals. And on the off chance that the spider doesn't fall asleep, they are going to have to take it down immediately. But they'd still be able to grab Jinho's armor which looked to be worth at least a few hundred million. He even starts looking up his family information so he can attend the funeral after he is dead. Jin Ho doesn't think this is a winnable fight either, so he tries to convince Jin Woo to look for a way to escape while they still can. Jin Woo knows that there is some truth to his words as an instance dungeon. The snake he found was probably only a D rank, as well as that golem, so they are nothing compared to a C rank monster of this scale. Yet even though there should be a large gap between their strengths, Jin Woo doesn't feel like shitting his pants like he did against the giant statue. So that means at level 18, he has grown strong enough to have a decent chance of beating this thing. He begins dodging as the spider strikes at him with its legs, but as he tries to strike back, the exoskeleton proves to be too hard to penetrate. Its strikes are also incredibly powerful, so he is sure a direct hit would most certainly be the end of him. Jinwoo continues to run and counter the spider's attacks while Jinho watches on in the background, utterly shocked by the battle he is witnessing. From how he is moving, Jinho can immediately tell that Jinwoo is not the level of an E rank. So he concludes that he must be a false ranker. False rankers are people who are able to control their magic output, so they can deliberately have the evaluation put them in a lower rank. But the problem with people like that is that they are almost always the kind to enjoy killing others just for the fun of it. Jinwoo is getting frustrated with the fight as he is still unable to pierce through the spider's armor, and his fatigue levels are slowly rising as well, so if things keep up as they've been going, he is going to slow down. If he intends to win, he's going to have to rely on his dagger's special ability to paralyze and drain a target's health. So to get one hit in, Jinwoo begins going after the spider's squishy eyes, but as he was approaching, it used another special attack and threw up acid. Now he can't get close without being in range for another acid attack, but he still needs to find a way to close that distance somehow. That's when he remembers one of the new skills he acquired that raises his speed, so he uses that to get under the spider and bounce off the wall to strike it right between the eyes. Unfortunately, the attack fails and he is forced to retreat, but that doesn't mean he's given up as he goes right back in for another strike. 
Shamu is certainly fast, but since he hasn't managed to land a single successful strike on the spider, he doesn't think he will be able to hold out much longer. And he is right, as the fatigue finally catches up to Jinwu, and he slows down to the point that the spider is able to hit him. He is now unable to move, so he is defenseless as the spider comes up to him and is about to squish his body. Luckily, there is still one game mechanic that he can use to his advantage, and that's the full recovery reward he was given. And now that he is back to full strength, he is able to finally stab through the spider's eye and inflict it with the status effects. And with paralysis now active, it is basically stunlocked for Jinwu to repeatedly stab it until it eventually dies. After defeating the boss, Jinwu levels up twice and thinks to himself that he was lucky he didn't accept the reward from the training he did earlier. If he had, then he probably wouldn't have made it out alive, proving that Gamer's natural instinct to hoard rewards was right. Jinho still can't believe what he has just witnessed, but this confirms that Jinwu's rank isn't accurate so to avoid getting on his bad side, Jinho resigns himself to being the baggage carrier and doing whatever Jinwu wants him to do. He even starts taking care of the mining as well, and Jinwu doesn't get why he is suddenly being so formal, but he isn't going to complain. Just then, the C-rank hunters return and are surprised to find that Jinwu and Jinho are somehow still alive. Jinwu was expecting this, and as the guys come down, they think to themselves that the boss may have been pretty weak if the two of them were able to beat it. But on the other hand, it is also possible that Jinho took out the monster with the high-level equipment he has on him, so Dong Suk makes him a proposal. Knowing that his father is insanely rich, he offers Jin Ho a chance to join them in their crimes, and if he agrees to do so, then they'll spare his life. He doesn't want to have to deal with any special effects the equipment might have, so all he wants him to do is kill Jin Wu. Of course, if he refuses, then they will both die together. Jin Ho, being a good person and having seen what Jin Wu is capable of doing, makes the smart decision to stick by his friend and stand against the ranks. So Dong Suk and the rest of his gang prepare to attack and kill them, however, as they approach, Jinwu receives a new quest from the system telling him that he now has to kill all six of them. But as he was distracted, one of the C-rank guys launches a huge fireball straight at him and knocks him back into a wall. Dong Suk thinks Jinwu is already dead, but he's just lying in the rubble and yelling at himself for being so foolish. The dungeon is a place where survival of the fittest is the law of the land and the emergency mission he just got is forcing him to kill these guys unless he wishes to die, so he has no choice but to become a murderer. But to be fair, these guys deserve it. He gets up and dusts himself off, much to the shock of the C-rank guides as they can't believe Jin Wu is still alive after taking a powerful hit like that. He then starts casually walking towards them, muttering to himself about if the system wants him to kill, then he's going to do whatever it takes to become stronger. However, these guys never got the sense to tell that their asses are about to get cooked and still feel way too confident because they still think he's only E-rank. One guy thinks Junwoo must be bluffing, so he walks right up to him and tries to assert dominance by displaying how much more powerful he is compared to an E-rank. But one second later, his head is rolling on the floor. Junwoo has just murdered someone, and although the circumstances require that he do this, he must still come to terms with the fact that he must kill if he wants to survive. The other ranks start taking this fight seriously and attack in earnest, but nothing they do is getting anywhere close to hitting Junwoo. A moment later, as one gets in close for an attack, Jinwoo sidesteps it and appears behind him to stab his neck. Following it up by stabbing another one in the gut. The stabs alone wouldn't have been enough to finish them off, but the paralysis and poison certainly did the trick, so he has just caught two extra bodies on the scene. They don't understand how an E-rank hunter could possess this level of power. Dong Suk is left as the last one alive and finally realizes that Jinwoo must have been the one who defeated the boss, but even if this team was killed, he isn't going to go down so easily since he is stronger than they were and even possesses a special skill to raise his power level, the Kaioken. He reasons that Jinwoo must at least be somewhat exhausted from killing the dungeon boss and five hunters, so with his buffed up strength, he should be able to fight on even footing against him. And you may be right about that, but he didn't have a plan ready for Jinwoo's hands. He gets his face palmed while Jinwoo tells him, Stand proud Dong Suk, for you are indeed strong, before smashing his face into the ground. Dong Suk now understands that he stands no chance of winning against a guy like Jinwoo, so he starts bargaining for his life by offering as much money as Jinwoo wants, but he has already attempted to kill him three times, so mercy isn't really on the table anymore. He tries to threaten Jinwoo with the law since murder is illegal, but as he started earlier, no one is able to find out what went down in a dungeon, and even if they did, this would still count as self-defense anyway. Dong Suk was about to play the do you know who my brother is card, but Jinwoo wasn't interested in hearing any more chatter, so he chopped it off his head mid-sentence. Jinho just witnessed that entire brutal massacre and his stomach can't take it, but the dungeon is closing so there's no time for a break. 
Outside, they have to give a report of what happened. And after telling the association employee that all the C rank hunters died of dungeon related causes, it sounds pretty suspicious. But she doesn't get paid enough to care and is more interested in the sword Jin Ho has in his possession, because there's apparently a new release in the weapon market. While they are talking, Junwoo takes a look at the reward he got from the emergency quest and sees he received a skill called Murderous Intent, which cuts the abilities of any afflicted opponent in half. The investigator chalks up their survival to Jinho's amazing equipment allowing him to beat the boss while Jinwoo hid away, so she accepts the explanation and ends the investigation there. Meanwhile, over in America, Dong Suk's brother has a feeling something is wrong. A while later, Chief Wu of the Hunters Association receives a report on the incident that occurred in the C-Rank dungeon. Six of the C-Rank hunters died in battle apparently, but the ones who managed to survive were actually a D and E-Rank hunters. Chief Wu assumes the lower-ranked guys must have run away when the situation got bad, but he stands corrected as he is informed that they actually managed to take down the dungeon boss by themselves. It sounds ridiculous, but they believe the D-Rank hunter. Jin Ho was the one who defeated the boss thanks to his high-level equipment. Wu grows bored and tells him to get straight to the point if he thinks there is something suspicious about the situation. But that's not the case, he just found it interesting that the other hunter who survived was Jin Wu. The same one who survived the double dungeon, which could just be a coincidence, but last time they checked, he was definitely still a weakling, so something interesting may have happened. There is also one other bit of concerning news, as it turns out that one of the c rank hunters who died was Dong Suk, and it's not like he's important in any way, but his brother happens to be Dong Su, so they may have a problem on their hands. Meanwhile, Jin Wu has just made it home and is greeted by his wonderful sister. She is excited because he brought home fried chicken, but asks if anything special happened to him because he usually never buys things like this. He can't really say that what happened to him is good, but he has managed to save up enough money for his mother's hospital bills, so he wanted to share a treat with her. As they eat, Jinna asks him about the raid he went on last time since he clearly got paid a lot, but he didn't have any of his usual injuries from dungeon raiding. She is glad he managed to get paid without landing in the hospital for once, but her question sends him into a whole existential analysis. He calmly recalls that he easily killed those guys with no hesitation, and he didn't even particularly hate them or anything. He was just doing what he had to do to survive. Jenna snaps him out of his philosophical debate and asks if he is feeling alright, so he tells her he was just thinking about her holy Roman Empire as all guys do. He takes a sip of his beer, but then a status window pops up and says a harmful substance was detected, so it will now begin detoxifying him. He wants to confirm what is going on, so gets up to go to his room, leaving the rest of the dried chicken for Gina. In his room, he downs several cans of beer, but each time, it gets broken down in his body by the system, so he can never get drunk again. He wonders if this is due to some sort of skill he got, so he checks the system and finds out that he acquired a skill called Blessing of the Weak as a reward. It is a skill that greatly increases his regenerative capabilities and also cancels all negative status effects that are placed on him. This was the reward he got from the double dungeon, but so much had been happening that he never thought to take a look at it. Now that he thinks about it, this skill is probably why he still has his arm and leg right now as it probably made his body grow them back while he was in a coma. There's still so much he doesn't understand about this system, but for now, he just decides to go to sleep. Later that night, Jinna comes into his room and tells him that someone named Jin Ho called for him, so after thinking about it for a bit, he decides to head out to go see him. The two meet at a cafe, and Jin Ho apologizes for calling him so suddenly. Jin Woo never really expected to see Jin Ho again after the mess they went through, but Jin Ho starts off by saying he is incredibly thankful for Jin Woo saving his life. Jin Wu also thanks Jin Ho for giving him the magic gem from the dungeon cause it really helped with his bills. He also thanks him for not reporting what really happened to the Hunters Association because it would have caused a great deal of trouble if they found out he killed the six hunters, even if it was in self-defense. Jin Wu asks him why he wanted to meet with him, so Jin Ho begins to ask Jin Wu to join an attack force with him. Before he is even done speaking, Jin Wu already refuses to join him because he's not the type of guy to hang around with Richard Kid. He gets up to leave, but Jin Ho pleads with him to just accompany him on 19 more dungeon raids, so he can meet the requirements for his goal. Jin Wu agrees to hear him out and sits back down, so Jin Ho starts explaining that he wishes to become a guild master. One of the conditions to become one is participating in 20 dungeon raids, and the one he went on with Jin Wu last time was his first. He is smart, and has studied hard, so he is confident in his ability to pass the written exam, but as for his combat skill, they are practically non-existent. He is trying to become a guild master partially because his father wishes to start a guild, which surprises Jinwoo. But it's not too strange as dungeons do hold some of the most valuable items on the planet. So establishing a guild and raiding dungeons to acquire these valuables would be a decent business venture. 
To do this, his father planned to hire an S rank hunter as the guild master and have Jinho's brother be the vice guild master. But Jinwoo doesn't see how they could possibly pull that off considering there are currently only seven S rank hunters in all of the country. Moreover, Min Byung-gu was the only one who hadn't joined a guild yet, but he already retired. That would leave the only option as poaching a hunter from one of the other guilds, but doing that would be equivalent to signing a death note for his guild. That is why Jin Ho wants to gain the experience required so he can become the guild master himself. This is where his proposal comes in as he knows Jin Woo wants to keep his power hidden. So he is going to need a trusted companion to go into the dungeons with him and keep his secret. And since he is still currently ranked as an E, it would be far more impressive for Jin Ho to clear dungeons while teamed up with him. And he didn't come without a plan either as he pulls a file out of his bag and presents it as a bargaining chip. It's the floor plan of a building owned by his father's company, which is currently valued at 30 billion. So if Jin Woo agrees, he can have the building. That means he would be getting paid 30 billion just to go on 19 raids. Normally, he would have accepted the job instantly. But since he is the only one in the world that can raise their level, it is a different story for him. If he keeps gaining experience at this rate, then someday he will get to S rank and maybe even surpass it. So by that point, 30 billion wouldn't be a lot of money to him anymore. There is also the fact that he isn't sure whether teaming up with people will affect his rate of leveling up, so for those reasons, he declines Jin Ho's offer. Meanwhile, over in America, Dong Suk's brother Dong Su is gathering information about Jin Woo and Jin Ho because they were the only ones who survived while his brother didn't. He gets his secretary to bring him the files and then asks what would happen if he killed someone over in another country. His secretary doesn't like where this conversation is going, but she answers that he would be prosecuted for his crime however, considering his position and good old abuse of political power, he would likely get some leniency in his punishment. With that settled, he asks her to clear his schedule because he has a definitely unrelated trip he has to go on, but she can't have him skip out on his duties as the guild master here, otherwise the guild would crumble while he's gone. In that case, he tells her to clear his schedule so he can take the trip later, and he hopes both Jin Woo and Jin Ho are still alive by the time he can get his hands on them. The next day, we see Jin Woo and Jina out for a morning run together. It is rare for her to want to exercise, but it's probably because she doesn't want to get fat after all that fried chicken she had last night. Jin Woo tells her to keep running at her own pace as he takes off so he can finish his daily workout quest. By the time he is done, he receives his reward but decides not to claim it yet in case he might need it later, like last time. He also notices that the counter is still going despite him already completing the 10 kilometers required. This gets him thinking that he may get an additional reward if he keeps going. So just as Jina finally caught up to him, he takes off again. After running for a while, he notices that the counter stopped once it reached 20 kilometers, so he does extra push-ups and sit-ups as well until he maxes them out as well and receives another reward. He gets to choose, so he picks a blessed random loot box and acquires a special key that opens a door to the demon castle. The difficulty is S rank, but it also says the ingredients to an elixir of life that can cure all illnesses can be gathered there, which is exactly what Jin Woo needs to help his mother. That night, he goes to visit his mother who is still unresponsive, and he decides then and there that he will do whatever it takes to cure her. Later, he opens the door to the demon castle even though it is an S rank dungeon. He has no guarantee that he will be able to handle the monsters that are present there, but he'll just have to take the risk. He enters the gate and is transported to a fiery hellscape, and he would be lying if he said he wasn't scared walking in here, but even if things get bad, he can still use the return stone he got from the instance dungeon. He runs into the first monster here and is confronted by a three-headed monster dog, so he charges forward to begin his attack. He activates his dash skill to get in close and slashes at the dog's heels, but he doesn't manage to do much damage to it. He gets pushed back and realizes the gap in strength between the two of them is too great, so he tries to use his murderous intent skill to level the playing field and weaken the monster, but it gets cancelled out due to the power difference. Jin Woo then tries stabbing it in the face with his dagger, but while the hit connects, the paralysis effect is not strong enough to keep the monster down. He is starting to run out of options and can do nothing but run and dodge, but he then gets caught off guard by the monster and has a chunk taken out of his arm with one bite. He then gets thrown into the ground and stomped on until one third of his health is gone. And if things weren't already bad enough, Cerberus activates a skill that doubles all its stats. So it is 100% unbeatable for Jin Woo by this point and before he can even articulate what is going on, he has been swatted into another wall with only half of his health remaining. He has no other options as Cerberus is charging at him again, so he accepts his full recovery reward and leaps onto its face before stabbing its eye. Jin Woo is glad he finally managed to do some damage, but then the system notifies him that the attack he just landed did absolutely nothing to harm it. He gets knocked back again and has his health drained until it is well below half. 
But Cerberus keeps on going and hits Jinwoo so hard that he does a quadruple roll on the floor. He is getting desperate, so he kicks up dust to give himself some cover and find a place to hide. He decides this is too dangerous, so he is going to use the return stone. But before he could do so, Cerberus found him and knocked it away. So Jinwoo has only two options left. Find a way to beat Cerberus or die. His health is critically low, but he already used his recovery reward, so he starts looking through the system to see if there's anything he can use to recover. Luckily, he manages to find the item store and purchases some bottles of healing potion to regain some health. But those things only heal 100 points, so they are basically useless to him now. As a last-ditch effort, he drinks the poison bottle he got a while ago for the 20% damage reduction just before Cerberus attacks again. And now that he is on the verge of death, Jimu attacks like a whole new person, striking Cerberus repeatedly and always aiming for the eyes every chance he gets. Eventually, with Jinwu's health nearing zero, all the damage he did to Cerberus finally catches up to it, and he has successfully killed it. He levels up several times, and as a result has the damage he took healed. But Cerberus was just the gatekeeper for the demon castle. So even though he has acquired the key to enter the castle, Jinwu realizes he is not ready yet and decides he will come back later, when he has more power. Jinwu is visiting his mother in the hospital and sits next to her, while he contemplates over the crafting recipe the system window has just shown him. The Elixir of Life's description says it can cure all illnesses, so maybe with this he may be able to finally bring his mother back from her long coma. The Elixir requires three different items, but he doesn't have any of them, so he can't craft it now. However, he does know where he can find the items, yet entering that gate now would be the same as suicide with his current level. Thus, Junwoo decides to return there once he has leveled up and become stronger. To that end, he meets back up with Jinho and decides to accept his offer to do 19 more raids with him. Jin Ho is over the moon now that Jin Woo has agreed to help, however, there are some conditions attached. Jin Woo wants only he and Jin Ho to enter the dungeons, no one else. Jin Ho stands shocked as he doesn't think he heard Jin Woo right the first time. There's no way he means he wants just the two of them to take on C-ranked dungeons, but that is exactly what Jin Woo means. Jin Ho tries to bring up the rule of meaning eight party members to be allowed to enter a C-ranked dungeon, but they can always just pad out the numbers by hiring people to sit outside while they conquer the dungeon. It may sound dangerous, but if it's just the two of them, it would mean they can ensure their safety throughout all 19 dungeon raids. And having a record of no fatalities across all the dungeon raids would certainly be a feat that his father could appreciate. When he puts it that way, Jinho has no choice but to agree to it. So he gets up and tells Jinwoo that he can lead the planning of the raids and gathering of teammates to him. Later, we see the rank hunter Cha Hei training on her personal track field while the cameraman is working his magic. Once she is ready to take a break, she sits down and take a break and calls out for the person hiding to reveal themselves. Knowing he has been spotting, the business suit man walks out and tells her he came to talk to her, but then he got a little distracted watching her. Following this, he hands her his business card as a representative for a guild. We cut to Jinho having a car ride with his dad while the two sit in awkward silence. His father is the first to speak up as he says the world has begun to revolve around dungeon exploration ever since the first gate appeared in this world. Now, everything from the economy to politics to conspiracy theories are linked to them. Even energy production is shifting to magic ore mined in the dungeon, so if his company needs to find a way to get those valuable energy crystals, at that involves having hunters of their own. The most powerful guild in play right now are the Hunters Guild, the White Tiger Guild, the Fiend Guild, the Fame Guild, and the Knights Guild. And as the five major guild powers in Korea, they basically hold a monopoly on all the resources from the dungeons. He can't just sit by and watch that monopoly continue, especially when the resources are falling into the hands of people who only care about themselves, when he, who has greatly contributed to the development of the country, could use it for much better causes. This is why he wants to start a guild. Jin Ho listens to his father's speech and agrees with what he said, but internally he wonders if he truly has what it takes to run its rank guild with his capabilities. In the park, Jim Wu is taking care of his daily training quests once more, but this time isn't counting past 100 anymore, so the last bonus quest must have been a one-time deal. That's certainly disappointing since he was hoping he could get another special loot box reward from doing that quest again. But then again, even if it is just the regular loot box reward, he may still be able to get something good out of it, like an instance dungeon key. He chooses the random loot box and hopes to get something good out of it, but once the light fades, all he gets out of it is a bingo card. He accepts his bad luck and starts walking to return home, and as he does so, he thinks about how the three agility points he gets for the morning training are no longer enough for the level of growth he wants. He would like to fight some monsters, but for now, it looks like he won't be able to do anything until Jin Ho gets his dungeon raids set up. 
He thinks back to those centipedes from the penalty zone, and they could be a good source of experience, but he isn't confident that he can beat them with his current strength, and it's not like he has a guarantee that the system would let him again experience from something that is meant to be a punishment. Just then, Janu receives a notification on his phone from the Hunters Association. They are forming a strike force for a D-ranked dungeon which appeared recently, so they request his participation. He isn't too thrilled by the idea of it since his strike force would mean that he can't fight at full capacity since he won't be alone, however, he'll take some fighting over nothing at all. Meanwhile, in a dojo, we see two swordsmen taking a break after a practice session, and a familiar face pops up. His student praises him for being so good with a sword, but he wishes he could have gotten a chance to practice back when he still had both arms, because arms are pretty important when using a sword. He may have lost a good chunk of his fighting ability with the loss of his arm, but it has been months since then so he's gotten over it. He receives the same alert about the task force, and his student asks him if he isn't going to retire from being a hunter after such an injury. He thinks back to the events of that day and how he managed to survive thanks to Jinwoo staying behind, so as long as he still lives, he would like to do something that helps society. We see another survivor from the double dungeon, and he is currently playing with his daughter when he tells his wife that he's being called into another dungeon raid team. She asks him if he really can't just retire from being a hunter and get a different job. She would be fine with it even if he had to flip burgers, she just wants her husband to come home alive, and not in two pieces like the other guys. He knows the dangers that come with the job better than anyone, but at the same time he has a young daughter to take care of, and college isn't going to pay for itself, so he's got to make good money somehow. Besides, the Hunter Association usually doesn't send hunters into dungeons which could possibly hurt them, last time was just a freak accident, so he should be fine. However, he makes the mistake of saying what could go wrong while he has got a lot to lose here. Elsewhere, Bake is angry after he got a troublesome interview offloaded onto him, and watching the recording back makes him feel like cringing. Although the offer for the interview did say it was for an upstanding and talented hunter, and the other guy is way too sketchy for that to be referring to him. Moving on, there was another reason he called for Bak to come here, and it involves the plan of the Yujin company owned by Jinho's dad trying to create their own guild. Bak knows all about it already since they tried to poach some of their hunters already, but he knows that he wasn't called here just because of that, so he asks once more to know the real reason he was asked to come here. We now cut to Jui who is still as depressed as when we last saw her. She is on a call with her mother who asks if she is alright and tries to convince her that she is better off quitting being a hunter since she is so scared of fighting. Jui doesn't like her own mother roasting her, even if it may be true, so she hangs up the call. She knows what her mother said is accurate, but when she remembers Jinwoo working so hard to improve himself, it gives her the confidence to try going on one more mission to prove to herself that she can handle this. And coincidentally, she receives the alert from the association about the dungeon strike force right after. We see Chaggy walking over to talk with Choi when she sees Beak angrily leaving the office. She heads in and speaks with him about the offer she received while she was training earlier today. The Eugen group wished to employ her for the guild they wished to start as the guild leader, and while it was certainly a good deal, the fact that she is reporting this to Choi at all means she turned down the offer entirely. Choi is relieved that she is still loyal to his guild, but Chaggy has some other questions she wants to ask. When she was coming in, she saw Beak leaving while looking like he was in a pretty bad mood, so she wanted to know what that was all about. We see Beak who is currently in a bar, drowning his frustration in alcohol as he recalls what he spoke with Choi about. Their conversation involved the Jeju Island incident which happened several years ago. After the third failed mission to clear all the monsters there, the island was declared off-limits and contact was sealed off entirely. Now they only perform periodic patrols to ensure that the monsters stay within the island, and now everyone has forgotten all about it. But Choi hasn't forgotten. He plans to conquer that island in the near future, and to do that, he needs the cooperation of all the major players so they can work together and get the public behind them. Thinking about the proposal, Beak certainly has some unfinished business on that island that he would like to take care of. And elsewhere, we see another man with unfinished business, hiring an assassin to take someone out for him. The next day, the time has come for the dungeon strike force to come together and Jinwu is about to head out to meet them. Jinna comes out to see him off and remarks that he rarely ever gets hurt anymore even though he used to be known as the weakest, but she attributes it to all the exercises he has been doing lately. He heads out and we see Song on his way there as well. He explains that although he is a skilled swordsman, his awakening did nothing for his physical abilities, so his swordsmanship is completely useless against magical beasts. As he continues to walk, he notices Jinwu and calls out to him since it has been a while. He can't believe how much he has changed since they last saw each other, he even managed to get his leg back somehow so Song thinks there must have been a high-level healer around to help him grow it back. On the other hand, he lost his hand because he was unable to get it treated soon enough to keep it alive. 
Regardless, he is still happy to seek Jinwoo here. They were both summoned to help handle the D-ranked dungeon, and so were all the other people who survived the double dungeon. Juhi is glad to see Jinwoo, but Kim and Kang both feel too guilty to look him straight in the eyes. It makes a lot of sense since when you think about it, they did abandon Jinwoo to die in there, and Kim even threatened Song with a sword, so he must feel pretty ashamed of himself. Juhi, on the other hand, is elated to finally get to talk to Jinwoo after all this time. But just as they are about to catch up, a van pulls up and three men come out with orange jumpers and chains on their wrists. This is either a fashion statement or the association really decided it was a good idea to bring criminals to a dungeon raid. They had already started causing trouble by harassing Juhi, but their handler put a stop to that really quickly. The others have this situation explained to them as they are informed of the policy the association came up with. The criminals wish to lower their sentences, so they have agreed to take part in dungeon raids alongside a handler, Kang, to keep them in check. Basically the suicide squad except the bomb in this case is Kang. The others are obviously unsettled by the prospect of having to trust criminals with their lives, but Kang is a B-rank hunter, so the representative assures them that if anything happens, then he will be able to take out the three of them. Jin Wu has a bad feeling about this, so he asks Jui to sit this one out so she doesn't end up hurt. However, she came here determined to get her confidence back as a hunter, so she still wants to go in despite his warning. The criminals are set free so they can fight effectively, but Kang makes it clear that they will die if they try anything funny. He then walks over to Jin Wu and Song and asks who will be leading the mission today, so Song requests to be put in charge and apologizes for his failure as a captain when they worked together last time. He blames himself for the seven people who died back then, but thanks to Jin Wu's quick thinking, at least six managed to survive, so he is truly grateful to him. They all head into the dungeon to clear it. As the group make their way through the dungeon, the criminals do their part in taking out monsters as they attack. They are enjoying the whole situation since it lets them go wild for the first time in a while. Their abilities are certainly impressive, but with how savage they are acting, Song can barely tell who is meant to be the monster in this situation. Some goblins try to sneak up behind him as well, but he still possesses the firepower necessary to be classified as a monster on his own as well. Jinwoo finishes taking out his share of monsters, and Song compliments him because it seems he has gotten a lot stronger than before. He even has such a great dagger, which he would never have been able to afford before. Jinwoo only smiles, but then Juhi points out that he hasn't gotten hurt even once since he entered this dungeon. Song can tell that he has really changed a lot since his aura is one of confidence and ease, but the monitor doesn't find his growth as interesting as the others, so he tells them to hurry up so they can keep going. Since the dungeon seems to be a whole lot easier than they had expected it to be, he suggests that they split up into three groups to cover more ground. It comes with greater risk, but it could mean they get to finish this raid a lot sooner as well. He tells everyone to inform him immediately, if they happen to find the boss room, as he will be taking the convicts down the path to the right. Jinwoo doesn't know the exact reason, but he can somehow tell the path that the boss is located on. Since he can't gain any levels from fighting low-level goblins here, he would rather take on the dungeon boss, so he suggests to Song that they should go down the left path. The other group decides to go down the middle, but as Jinwoo is leaving, he locked eyes with Kang, who can tell something is off about him. But he leaves it alone for now and heads down his own path. Kim and the other survivor are dealing with the goblins on their path, and he is confident in his ability to defeat goblins of this level. The dungeon must be fairly easy if the association thought it was a good idea to bring Jinwoo who is still classified as the world's weakest hunter, but then again, that's the same thing they thought last time. Kim falls silent for a bit, and after some thinking, he declares that he will apologize to Jinwoo for what happened before once they meet back up. He ran away and abandoned Jinwoo even though he calls himself a hunter. Over with Kang, he is watching the convicts have fun slaying the goblins and he can't help but be irked that they are basically having a playdate when this is supposed to be hard labor. They finish off the goblins, but are still itching to kill something, but Kang stops them to ask if they would kill humans the same way they just killed the goblins. They all answer unanimously that they would see nothing wrong with killing humans, straight to the face of their parole officer. Kang then thinks back to a meeting he had with a man before he came on this mission. The guy says the guys went to jail because they did severely illegal things to his daughter, but in the end, she ended up hanging herself from the trauma. His wife also ended up in a mental hospital after the incident, but as for the criminals that are going to be released in a few years like nothing happened. What's worse is that they still have their hunter's licenses, so they can probably reduce their sentences even further by taking part in some dungeon raids. It isn't fair that they get basically no real punishment for their crimes, so the man opens a bag he had brought with him and offers Kang 3 billion if he is willing to kill those criminals for him. No one will know what happens within the dungeon so Kang won't get in trouble for doing it, Plus, it would be really easy for him to do so. Back to the present, Kang has already come up with a cover story and decides to report to the department that the convicts ran into a hundred goblins here. 
Meanwhile, Kim and the other guide are coming to the end of their tunnel, but they end up witnessing something that they were ready for. Kang has already killed two of the convicts, and he is currently holding the last one up by his throat, intent on torturing him extensively at the request of that old man. Just then, he notices Kim and the other guy were watching him, meaning the tunnel they took must have been connected to this one. That saves him some time with finding the boss room since it must be along the tunnel Jinwoo and the others took. He pulls out his knife and slices off the convict's head in one swipe, and then begins walking over to Kim and the other guy to make sure there are no witnesses. Jinwoo recalls the fact that Kang was there when he was being re-evaluated by the association at the hospital, but he hopes he hasn't been recognized yet. Jinwoo suddenly hears a scream coming from the other side of the dungeon, so he rushes over along with Song and Juhi, but once they arrive, it was already too late. The criminals were long dead, but now so is Jung Ho. They then hear a faint breath from Kim, meaning his is still alive even if he is only clinging to life by a thread. Jinwoo asks Juhi to heal him quickly, and once she starts healing, he is able to regain consciousness. Song takes a look at the wounds he has sustained, and they look nothing like what a magical beast could do. They seem to be from a sharp blade, and it looks like whoever did this to him was avoiding dealing fatal blows just to make the fight last longer. With the little breath he can manage to muster, Kim tells them that it is pointless to try to save him because no amount of Jui's healing magic will be able to help him recover before he succumbs to his wounds. Jinwoo loses his cool and tells Kim that he can't die here, he has to live for the sake of his family, and so he can continue holding a grudge against him. Kim apologizes to him, although he didn't want it to happen like this, he wanted to be able to lower his head so he could properly apologize, but this is the best he can offer in his current state. Kim's eyes glaze over as the last embers of life leave his body and Juhi is trembling because she wasn't able to save him in time. But in that same instant, Kang, who was hiding in the roof, leaps forward and tries to stab Juhi in the face. Jinwoo was able to notice on time and caught his hand before he could kill her, but Kang immediately steps back to put some distance between them. He wanted to take out the healer and the team first, but he didn't expect that one of them would be able to block his attack. Song questions him to find out if he was the one behind all this and he doesn't deny the accusations. Song was about to tell him all the reasons why what he did is wrong, but as you can tell by now, Kang just doesn't give a damn. While Song was talking, he thought of a good excuse he could use to explain why everyone ended up dying. They'll claim the criminals tried to escape, so they killed all the others and then ambushed him, and of course he would have no choice but to defend himself from their attacks, so in the end, the only one to survive will be him. Jinwoo is about ready to beat Kang to a pulp, but Song steps in and says he will handle him instead since he still doesn't know Jinwoo is the main character. He picks up Kim's sword and asks Judy to cast physical enhancement magic on him so he will be able to keep up with Kang. Although he may be a mage, he still has the skills of a swordsman, and with Kang being an assassin, his defenses might be low enough for his skill to make a difference. He blocks the first strike thrown by Kang, but Kang doesn't see the point of Song trying to fight with a sword since he will never be as good as a B-rank assassin like him. For a moment, Song manages to surprise Kang and catch him off guard, but it still wasn't enough to finish things as Kang is simply toying with him. After another brief clash, Song ends up getting slashed, but Juhi immediately heals him so he can keep fighting. Kang finds her interference to be annoying, so he attempts to go after her instead, but that leaves him open to being attacked by Song again. He has to admit that Song is no pushover when it comes to handling a sword, but the fact still remains that there is no way he could ever truly keep up with the speed of an assassin. Song gets slashed several times, but when Juhi tries to heal him, she realizes she has run out of magic power. With no healing in his injured state, the chances of Song surviving are really low. Kang raises his sword to finish him off, but Song had one more trick up his sleeve and used his power as a mage to engulf him in flames. It would have been fatal if the attack had landed, but Kang managed to dodge out of the way in time, so it looks like Song is really out of options now. Or at least, that would be the case if Jinwoo wasn't here to save the day. Kang doesn't understand how Jinwoo was able to stop his attack just now if he is meant to be E-rank. Even Song isn't sure what to make of the situation, but Kang concludes that Jinwoo must have been hiding his skills. There is no way he could be a false ranker since he seems to know the others here and false rankers would never lead witnesses to their power, so the only other possibility is that Jinwoo has gone through a double awakening. Juvi and Song are both equally shocked to discover this, but that doesn't mean Kang will be backing down anytime soon. Jinwoo asks him why he did what he did so Kang explains that he was hired to kill them by the father of their victim. However, that's not what Jinwoo was asking and doesn't care about the criminals, but why did he kill Kim who was innocent? He could understand if he did it to silence them, but he could have done that without torturing them, so he must have done it just for the sake of toying with their lives. He claims he killed the criminals for the sake of the victim, that's not true either. 
He probably just did it to satisfy his desire to kill. It looks like Junwu's intuition was correct as Kang reveals his real intentions. After the old man offered him the money for the job, Kang told him that he has the wrong idea about him. He is a skilled B-rank hunter who has received tons of offers from powerful guilds, yet he still chose to work at the Hunters Association for the meager wage they offer by comparison. The reason is simple, he finds it a lot more dot fun to kill people than magical beasts. He lunges at Jinwoo, confident that he can defeat him since there are limits to what an E-rank should be able to do, even if they are reawakened. They continue their clash at speeds so great that Song can barely keep track of them. As the two clash one more time, they can tell that they are completely matched in speed with one another, but Kang thinks he has the edge since he has more experience battling high-ranked hunters than Jinwoo does. But as they separate from one another, Kimwu gets a notification from the system, telling him that he now has to kill Kang by all means necessary. Kang doesn't understand what Jinwoo is talking about, but he could tell his chances were slipping once Jinwoo started moving his feet like that. Jinwoo dashes in and he is moving even faster than before, so Kang ends up getting slashed. The special effects of the dagger kicks in, so Kang is now poisoned, but that doesn't stop him from continuing his fight with Jinwoo and unveiling his own special ability. In an instant, he completely vanishes from the scene and Jinwoo has no idea where he has gone. He is attacked out of nowhere as Kang reveals that his stealth ability allows him to conceal everything about himself, from the sight of him, to the sounds he makes and even his smell. So now there is no way for Jinwoo to figure out where the attacks will be coming from. No one knows he has this ability, and that's because no one whom he had used it on has ever survived to tell the tale. Now that he has slashed Jinwoo's leg, he won't be able to move as fast anymore, and although Jui wanted to help him, Kang was too powerful for her to do anything against him. Kang mockingly asks Jinwoo if he thinks he can dodge his next attack with that injured leg, but he has had enough of Kang's yapping, so he uses the system's full recovery reward and gets up to face him again. Kang is now wary of Jinwoo because he had no idea he was able to heal himself. But for how Jinwoo looks at him, he can tell that this isn't his first time killing someone. In the dungeon, laws aren't worth anything, so the only thing that matters is being the strongest one there. He activates his stealth ability again to attack, but this time, Jinwoo can sense all his attacks coming. He can still sense the bloodless coming from Kang. And when the opportunity presents itself, he uses his murderous intent ability to scare Kang into letting his guard down, at which point he was stabbed through the chest. Although he lost, he isn't upset about it because that's just the way things go, but before he dies, he at least wants to know what Jinwoo is since he has never fought someone as strong and versatile as him. Jinwoo just says he is a hunter that can grow stronger with each fight. Kang takes solace in knowing he was taken out by someone as strong as Jinwoo, but he warns him that the stronger he gets, the more disconnected he will get from the world. Kang has officially passed away, but Jinwoo can't deny what he said as he has definitely grown stronger, but at the same time he can feel something inside him falling apart. Juvi and Song thank him for saving them, but Jinwoo just tells them to get to safety outside the dungeon while he clears it himself. Later, Manager Wu shows up after hearing the news of what Kang did. He can't believe he was killing people in secret all this time, although now he thinks about it, Kang was always kind of sketchy to begin with. He apologizes to them for the trouble that was caused, but he wants to know who it was that killed Kang. Jinwoo believes his time is up as he can't hide his strength from the association anymore, but to his surprise, Song steps up and claims he was the one who defeated Kang with the help of Jui. Wu doesn't believe Song would have been able to pull it off, but he doesn't want to investigate further, so he just accepts their testimony as the truth. This is Song's way of thanking Jinwoo for saving his life back there since he knows Jinwoo must have his reasons for keeping his strength secret. Three hours later, the case was closed as with the investigation showing that it was a legitimate case of self-defense. After that, we see Jinwoo in the park with Jui, where she pulls out that magic stone he gave her back in the double dungeon and asks if he still remembers the promise he made to her. This was the end of episode 9. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to not miss the next part.